Hi, everyone. I'm Emily Kane, and this is my lecture on um, competence to make treatment decisions. So this includes five major components um, that we learned about in Melton E.T. All um, from 2018, our textbook that we have. So the first is requirements for informed consent. Um, this includes disclosure, competence, and voluntariness. The second major component uh, is right to refuse psychoactive medications. We'll go into what this entails and when it's appropriate. The third um, is research and informed consent. So like we saw from the first uh, component, it's also disclosure, competence, voluntariness. The fourth is evaluating competence to make treatment decisions. And the fifth and last, fifth and last, excuse me, is research on evaluations for and psychiatric advanced directives. Okay, so our first one that we looked at was requirements for informed consent. The main reason for informed consent was to give the individual the rights to their own body. Um, this was to help with more educated decision making for themselves, uh, giving them bodily autonomy, basically. Um, and this was overall protection of safety for everyone involved. So researchers, patients, clinicians, um, everybody detailed within uh, the consent situation. This consists of three levels, as we learned from our textbook uh, disclosure, competent patient, being a competent patient, and voluntary consent. Uh, the first of the three main elements for informed consent. So this includes disclosure. So this is all about making sure everyone is completely aware of what is happening. This answers the five W's, the who, what, when, where, and why. Everything is detailed in disclosure. Uh, this should make the patient feel comfortable enough to make an adequate decision regarding their health, their treatment plan, everything that it entails, um, if the clinician finds it applicable for them to be uh, in, in charge of their own mental health treatments. The disclosure right can be waived by the patient, however, and it is not necessary in emergencies. The second element um, is competence. And for the most part, it is presumed there is competence to make a treatment decision. Only it is recognized in certain situations, however, if the patient refuses the treatment given to them or prescribed by the clinician, the active clinician, um, or there is a major medical experimental procedure that requires informed consent, um, actively consenting to what may happen with the experimental procedure and that the patient is cognizant of giving the informed consent. So they understand why they have to give the um, verbal and a uh, different type of consent. Voluntariness would be the third and last element for informed consent. This includes more, it's a more legal based. So it's a separation of voluntariness and competence. Uh, unfortunately, this can lead to poor legal decision-making um, by the patient as well. The second uh, we learned about was the right to refuse psychoactive medications, also known as the right to refuse treatment. This deals with the refusal of antipsychotic drugs. Um, as we learned about Washington v. Harper, this um, case involved involuntary use of psychotic medications against an inmate. Um, is this a medical or legal issue? So some feel that the refusal is a symptom of the mental illness um, themselves that they aren't cognizant enough to fully understand um, why they might be refusing the treatment. However, others feel that it is a gross intrusion on individual autonomy and privacy. This would be more of the legal issue, legal side and uh, reasoning for that. So research on informed consent, um, the first being disclosure. Again, like we saw earlier, there is some similarities to this as the first uh, slide that we saw. So disclosure through research, we see that mental health professionals stray away from informed consent, sometimes uh, because of legal reasoning. Um, other forms of disclosure are often lengthy and drawn out and often cannot be comprehended by the individual or the patient themselves. So really they want to keep the patient involved, but they fear that um, the lengthy drawn out process might be a negative for them and they might not fully understand what's happening. Um, competence, fewer than half the persons with significant mental illness were incompetent, but that severely mentally ill individuals, particularly those with thought disorders, were less likely to be competent to make treatment decisions. 
as you learned, is a reason for competence and voluntariness. Taking medications prescribed, is it voluntary or is it influenced by medical professionals? So really breaking down and making sure that patients are voluntarily taking their medications rather than being influenced by, you know, the doctors and nurses surrounding them um, and, and influencing their decisions that way. The fourth was the evaluating competence to make treatment decisions. Is the informed consent present when being evaluated for the treatment? Um, is there consent actually at the time when the clinician is evaluating for their future treatment plan? Um, treating physicians may be present at time of evaluation or not, depending on if the um, psychiatric cl clinician feels that they may sway their opinion, like I talked about earlier. Patient knows and understands the purpose of their treatment, their benefits, the risks, different type of treatments, and possible benefits and risks of that different type of treatment. Um, having the patient tell them why this is important and useful for them in their own words, why they believe the treatment will work, why it might not work, um, being fully engulfed into why this treatment um, was given to them, why the plan for it, reasoning behind it, and obviously voluntary consent. The fifth and last one was research on and evaluations for psychiatric advanced directives or PAD. PAD helps with decision-making for treatment plans for the future. So there are three different types of PADs. Um, the first being a particular set of instructions for patients' understanding of treatments. So making sure um, that they are fully aware of every little detail that would go on within the treatment itself and making sure that they are cognizant of what it all entails, like I had just mentioned, risks, benefits, all the good stuff. Um, the second type is what helps them pick a proxy for decision-making. So as we see for legal reasons, like a power of attorney, this um, gives them the ability to still keep their bodily autonomy. However, it also gives them the option to use a beneficiary or somebody who um, would be a proxy to them to help them make that decision-making. And the third kind would be a, a balance of the two. So it literally just involves both the first and the second type of PAD um, as, a, as a type of PAD. And this is the article I found super interesting. Um, it is competency and cap capacity to make treatment decisions a primer, excuse me, a primer for primary care physicians. So basically this is just showing a through Z as to why competency and capacity um, for medical decision-making is super important and why we um, need to have it. Lastly, my question, what would be an extreme circumstance that would not be able to apply all five components to com competence to make treatment decisions? Would there be legal ramifications? Why or why not? Uh, thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed.